In the early 1980s, the domestic auto industry was trying to adjust to the corporate average fuel economy standards that had been implemented in the 1970s in pursuit of better gas mileage on all sold vehicles in the United States. This is one of the reasons that cars got significantly smaller in the late 1970s and into the early 1980s, and also came with rather anemic engines under hood, really because automakers were trying to meet new emission standards and also fuel economy standards with their offerings. This drove significantly smaller sized vehicles, which were sometimes hard for the buying public to accept, especially given that inflation was relatively high at the time. And people often thought that they were paying more when they bought a new vehicle for something that was physically much smaller in size versus what they were trading in. In 1982, General Motors introduced its J-Car lineup, which included the Chevrolet Cavalier, the Pontiac J2000, the Olds Forenza, the Buick Sky Hawk, and yes, even the Cadillac Cimarron in 1982. The J-Cars were to be one of General Motors' first world cars, so to speak, similar to some of the T-Cars like the Chevette and Pontiac T-1000, and use a lot of components that were the same across the globe. They also were very small in size compared to what the typical GM buyer was used to, with a wheelbase of just 101.2 inches and an overall length of 170.4 inches, as well as a curb weight under 2,400 pounds, the J-Cars were diminutive compared to what Americans were used to driving at the time. And GM really had its work cut out for itself in trying to make these small vehicles feel somewhat roomy on the inside for buyers who are used to driving around much larger vehicles. Of course, numerous buyers had purchased Chevrolet's Vega and Pontiac Astra in the early and mid-1970s that had similar size as the J-Card, about 170 inches in overall length and an even smaller wheelbase at 97 inches. But these cars were not well loved by their owners and many had very poor experiences with them, in particular rusting issues and issues with the aluminum block engine under hood, including overheating and cylinder head warping, as well as overall engine failure, were relatively commonplace. So common, in fact, that in the mid-1970s, GM actually introduced what they called the Durabilt 2300 engine in the Vega just to rebrand the powertrain because it had so many issues. Thus, the J-Car had its work cut out for it in terms of winning the hearts and minds of the American buying public. Now, as I mentioned, one of the interesting things about the J-Cars was that GM was really trying to meet corporate average fuel economy standards with the vehicle, as well as deliver an overall pleasant package to potential customers. This was a hard trade-off to make. And one of the things that may seem humorous in this day were vehicles make six, seven hundred, even a thousand horsepower in the case of the new Hummer EV, is that GM actually had an objective of achieving 16 seconds zero to 60 with the automatic transmission in these J cars and 14 seconds zero to 60 with the manual transmission. That seems almost humorously slow by today's standards, but that was the actual objective that GM was trying to achieve and thought that it was optimal from the perspective of acceleration versus fuel economy. It certainly would not be acceptable today, although I will tell you that I have driven these cars and I own one, and so long as you get used to it, it's just fine. At least you're not going to be rushing trying to get anywhere in one of them, and you'll drive the speed limit, that's for sure. But the interesting part about the J-Car comes in terms of what GM put under hood. In fact, at the time, GM was evaluating three different engines to put under hood in the J-Car to see what would be most optimal. One of the choices that GM had was a standard overhead valve inline four-cylinder engine. This allowed relatively good packaging, given that it didn't have an overhead camshaft sprocket and drive that was required at the front of the engine. That would then mean that accessories would have to be mounted in a rather compact position. It also was, let's call it what it is, cheap to manufacture. Another alternative was an overhead cam inline four-cylinder, similar to what was under hood in the Chevette and Pontiac T1000. This was an engine design that perhaps would give a little bit more power, 
But as I mentioned previously, the packaging made it rather challenging because of the need for serviceability on the overhead camshaft drive. The third option that GM was evaluating was, and I'm saying this correctly, a 60-degree V4. Yes, you heard that right. GM was evaluating a 60-degree V4 engine that was effectively a Chevrolet 60-degree 2.8-liter V6 with two cylinders lopped off. This is a rather humorous configuration, and it was used in some cases by a number of different auto companies. Of course, Saab had a V4. Ford had a V4 in Europe for some period of time. A number of motorcycle engines from Honda, Yamaha, and others have had the V4 configuration. But the idea here was to have an engine that could run down the same machining line as the Chevrolet V6, use the same pistons and valve train, and basically almost everything from a machining perspective and from a components perspective, aside from the fact that it had two cylinders lopped off the end. It was a very interesting approach, shall we say, to the engine that could find itself under hood in the J-car. And while it sounds rather strange to begin with, it actually kind of made sense. Chevrolet effectively lopped off the number one and two cylinders from their 60-degree V6 engine, ran this particular configuration down the same machining line as their V6, and it presented the shortest overall engine length of the three choices that I mentioned because you only had two cylinders in overall length that had to be accommodated under hood. Of course, the challenge, though, was that the 60-degree V4 was obviously the widest engine of the three over the exhaust manifolds, and the accessories would have to be mounted in the front of the engine because of its width. Given this, it really lost its length advantage because the accessories had to be packaged in the space in which the two cylinders had been eliminated. So the overall benefits of this 60-degree V4 really were negated by the fact that it had to force the packaging of all the accessory drives in those two cylinders that no longer existed. Instead, what ended up happening was that Chevrolet ended up powering their J-Car in 1982 with a 1.8-liter asthmatic four-cylinder that was effectively still a parts bin engine with respect to sharing a number of components with the Chevrolet 60-degree V6. In fact, this 1.8-liter four-cylinder shared pistons, piston pins, piston rings with the Chevrolet V6, as well as numerous valve train components. Again, it was really just a parts bin engine that GM took a number of components from its V6 and made a four-cylinder out of it. Needless to say, it was not an overall successful power plant. Many customers complained that it just was way too slow with 88 horsepower and 100 pound-feet of torque. And in the next year, GM enlarged it to two liters. It made a little more horsepower, 90 horsepower, and 110 pound-feet of torque, but it was definitely a noticeable difference, shaving a couple seconds off the 0 to 60 time in enlarging the engine by 0.2 liters. Regardless of the final solution, it is interesting that GM actually contemplated production of a 60-degree V4 engine and was seriously considering it for production in the J-cars, although it obviously didn't make it through to production. Fortunately, in later years, the 60-degree V6 would actually make it under hood in the J-car, and this would actually prove to be a very nice, peppy power plant under hood in these light vehicles. I have one in my 1986 Cimarron, and I can tell you that it is really a hoot to drive because the car is so light, and despite the fact that the V6 only makes 135 horsepower, when the car weighs 2,500 pounds, that makes it feel like a relative rocket ship, especially for the times. Hope you enjoyed this spotlight on GM 60 degree V4 and the J cars. If you did, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and check out the video thumbnails at bottom left and right for some suggestions for you. Thanks again for watching.